Thank you very much indeed, Dr. McAnallen. Uh, our third and final speaker this evening, last but not least, is Dr. Catherine Morris. Um, Dr. Morris uh, studied literature at Cambridge University and uh, took her PhD at um, TCD and then Aberdeen. Um, she is currently cultural coordinator for Trinity College and the National Library of Ireland. And her recent book um, is Alice Milligan and the Irish Cultural Revival, which uh, has just appeared. Um, and indeed, uh, she has curated an exhibition recently um, in Dublin on Alice Milligan. And uh, I know Dr. Morris has researched Alice Milligan uh, really in local archives from uh, Alice Milligan's native county of Tyrone to the glens of Antrim to County Cork. And uh, I'm very glad to say that a descendant of Alice Milligan is actually, I believe, in the audience uh, here this evening. She was a lady who really outlived her memory, uh, dying in her 90s in 1953 in the old rectory in Oma, and on her tombstone, erected by her unionist uh, brothers, uh, are the famous words, she loved no land but Ireland. Uh, Dr. Morris. It's a real pleasure to be uh, asked to speak in Belfast, um, because of course this is where Alice Milligan spent so much of her time. Um, so thank you very much to the, uh, to the Community Relations Council and to the National Lottery, to Deirdre, to Paul, to Helen, uh, for inviting me to give this talk tonight. It means a great deal to me to be here. Um, Alice Milligan actually in 1893 was asked to lecture in the Ulster Museum, um, and in her diary, which the, uh, John Wilson, who owned that diary uh, and gifted it to the National Library. Um, in 1893, she writes, um, I read my paper on historic Ulster in the museum to a crowd of people and a host of gulls in flock. I was not applauded till I came to Belfast in 1798. Um, <laughs> And of course, 1798, uh, you know, the, the, I mean, these lectures are very much about uh, the idea of memory. And 1798 for Alice Milligan was an absolutely key moment for her. Um, not least because I think she, she, she came to feel that this was the point at which Catholic and Protestant in Ireland came together uh, to forge uh, a new sense of, of what a, a cultural um, and civic society could be. And it was always through looking back into the past and trying to match that sense of, of memory and imagination uh, that Alice Milligan's works uh, derive. Last week um, on Saturday in the Irish Times, Declan Kybert wrote an essay really about Alice Milligan in which he said, um, Alice Milligan believed that the greatest sin a people could commit was to bring the, bring the work of the dead to nothing. Her lifelong project in novels, poems, plays, journalism and tableau was to liberate the still unused energies buried in the Irish past and to demonstrate their rich potential for her generation. He concluded his essay by writing, Alice Milligan did more than most of her brilliant generation to expand the expressive freedom of citizens. And even in today's Ireland, we are still learning how to be her contemporaries. Um, I suppose I, in, in this brief talk, I just want to answer a couple of questions. Who was Alice Milligan? And what were her key achievements? Why was she written out of history? And why should we remember her? I'll briefly just give you, you know, for people who have not heard of Alice Milligan um, and who may know very little about her, I'll just tell you some brief chronology of her life before focusing on some of those achievements. Um, she was born in 1866 uh, to a very large family, um, 13 siblings, uh, in a village just outside of Oma. Um, her father then, uh, he... he um, he used to uh, sell linen almost as a, a commercial traveler. He then um, became the first executive of the first department store in Belfast, which was in the bank buildings. So the family moved to Belfast, and Alice Milligan and all of her siblings were educated right across the road um, in Methodist College. And it, it's just that extraordinary sense in which men, uh, the, the boys as well as the girls, were educated to the same high level. This is, you know, in the, in the 1870s. So an incredibly enlightened family, an incredibly enlightened ed educational environment. Um, while Alice Milligan's sisters uh, went to study music in Europe, Alice Milligan in 1890 
uh, chose to go to Dublin to study Belfast, uh, to study um, the Irish language. This almost came on, this came on the back of teacher training, uh, where she was teaching in Derry, um, and of writing. It was in 1891, the death of Parnell, which really opened up a void in constitutional politics for many. And, and, and really filling that void was culture. And Alice Milligan became very um, swept up in a, in a cultural movement, uh, in, a, in a way in which um, culture became a, a form through which people could uh, imagine a different kind of uh, society in which they were living. So from really from 1891 all the way through to 1916, she's engaged in, in theatre movement. Um, that extraordinary picture that we saw uh, that Donald showed of the Feshna Glen, um, theatre in writing, in trying to define what a national theatre might be, what a national culture might be, uh, the forging and the formation of Irish uh, presses, of publishing houses. And so very much engaged in that cultural movement with her contemporaries of Yeats, of George Russell, of so many uh, of those key figures who we've heard, uh, Bulma Hobson that Donald also mentioned. Um, in 1916 to 1922, she uh, very much supported Roger Casement. And she set up a bookshop in, in Dublin um, to help raise funds for Irish political prisoners. And again, was writing poetry and, and staging plays um, to, to re-engage the key questions of that time through a cultural language. From 1922, um, after her brother uh, was demobilized from the British Army, Alice Milligan moved to the north with uh, her brother and really became a full-time carer um, for her brother and lived with his family, um, her sister-in-law and, and nephew. Um, she dies in 1953, but from that period also, she's very, um, she's very engaged. She's very engaged in the anti-partition movement, but she's also looking back to that moment. In the revival period, Alice Milligan is constantly looking back into history in order to, to think about the principles and the values and the cultural heritage that might offer the key to a new future. In that period post-partition, she's looking um, back into that revival period and thinking about some of the principles and some of the very communitarian, anti-sectarian uh, movements that she helped to found in order to think about ways forward um, in, in that, in that post-partition era when she's living in Oma with her family. Um, I think it was really only in that, in, after the peace process began in the 1890s that certainly my research became possible. Um, and, it, and it took me 15 years to, to really uh, to research her works, um, not least because she published mainly in newspapers. And I think that to reflect on just some of Alice Milligan's uh, main and key achievements, I think one thing that she did uh, that was very extraordinary and that has been forgotten. I mean, here we are in Belfast, where Alice Milligan founded so many cultural, political, feminist, literary organizations. And I don't think there's one plaque on one of those walls. I mean, Donald showed the Shan van Vocht that was published in Georgia Street. That There is no sense of, of where those things were. The extraordinary Irish Women's Association that she helped to found in Belfast, Portadown, and Money Ray in 1893. Um, which, which was really, these organizations that she founded were, were founded so that Protestant and Catholic could come together. People who were of very different politics, whether it was Unionist, Socialist, Fabian, um, Nationalist, Republican. She was trying to found uh, cultural organizations and cultural um, forms of engagement that, that people could come together in. And so putting the North on the map of the Irish cultural revival was a major achievement. After Parnell died in 1891, um, Alice Milligan was in, uh, in Belfast with their family and they went to a musical um, occasion, uh, 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 I think it was a Gilbert and Sullivan show. And she came back that night and wrote in her diary, I am in the enemy's camp. If I had but the money, I would go to Dublin to be with people who feel as I feel. And that's a kind of, a, it's an articulation of alienation and of political difference. Her family were, you know, they were, they were unionist, um, but they were also incredibly enlightened and, and utterly engaged in the idea and the values of, 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 of Irish culture uh, and music and language. Um, Alice Milligan didn't go to, to, to Dublin to be with people 
who felt as she felt, like Yates and, 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 and Hyde and co. She stayed in Belfast and because that was the more difficult space. She knew that there could be no, no vision of a new civic society without the, the, without the North. She helped to organize, and, and in a way, when we think about Douglas Hyde and Owen McNeill founding the Gaelic League, at a point at which the Irish language really was in crisis. And yet Alice Milligan uh, did so much to really um, create the cultural conditions that would give that language meaning. Wittgenstein argues that, you, you know, that a language without a, a social context cannot really take root or have meaning. And the, one of her other key, um, I think, uh, major achievements is the space in which she gave uh, Irish women. Um, she, you know, she, she worked very much with women in, in, in theatre productions and in tableau to give women uh, a much greater space in public life. And of course, all of those incredible um, achievements in working uh, with people of very different political views, of travelling Ireland, of, of forging theatre uh, and language movements across the whole of the island of Ireland, these were also the key reasons why she was written out of history. Um, the fact that uh, so many of the archives that I've collected and, and in fact that we publish in the book uh, in, in illustrations, these were, these were not necessarily what we would consider um, official archives. These were magic lantern slides. She was uh, very intrigued with, um, with early photography. She would travel uh, with her father, Seton Milligan, uh, with the Belfast Naturalist Field Club, where they would take photographs and then project them into public space in lectures. Alice Milligan developed this within the, Irish, within the revival movement. Um, but glass slides smash. I would go to many places where people would turn up with tin boxes and say, is this a tableau? Is this an example of a tableau? And so we have you know, very few photographs of these tableau shows or of people building the stages and making the costumes for these theatrical productions, which were essentially about building community. But so, so in a way, it was that very scattered, very unofficial archive. The fact that she published from the 1880s all the way through to the 1940s in newspapers. I can remember um, reading how in 1941, uh, community in Omer tried uh, to commemorate Alice Milligan then. Uh, and they tried to, to collect her works, and they said it was just impossible. They gave up because they couldn't find, I mean, she published so much. Plays, poetry, novels, short stories, memoirs, um, journalism, and she published everything in newspapers because she would know that if a play was published in a newspaper, it could reach a very remote part of, uh, of Southwest Cork or of Donegal um, by tomorrow in a newspaper. 11, 12 people could buy it, 12 people would have the script. And she gave over the copyright for these to the Irish language movement. So that sense of visual culture and non-textual forms of cultural production were really um, very difficult to trace. The other two, two reasons that, that I would like to um, suggest that, that Alice Milligan disappeared from our memory um, is also to do with partition. I would say that after partition, which state would claim her? In the South, you had this incredibly patriarchal, sectarian, Catholic state uh, where the revival was being almost rewritten as a very southern-based uh, formation with the Abbey Theatre or with the Gaelic League being very Dublin-based. Um, and in the, in the north, she would have just been very... Um, I think she would have just been limited to a definition of a Republican in a very limited sense of that word and not in that 1798 or internationalist sense of the word. The internationalism that Milligan brought by editing something like the Shan van Vocht, which had a readership in South Africa and South America, was, was truly extraordinary, but very uh, quickly forgotten. And the final reason is the fact that she was a woman. Women were watching themselves being written out. Even as early as 1902, women were writing to each other, feeling that they were being written out. When Yates stood up at a, an Irish theater um, event, Alice Milligan couldn't go because Anna Johnston, her, her, her colleague, had, had recently died. Um, and, uh, so, you know, she, somebody wrote to Milligan and said, Yates stood up and he thanked the Faye brothers and George Russell, and he never once mentioned the women who had funded and organized this whole theatrical event. 
In 1919, Susan Mitchell, one of Alice Milligan's contemporaries, wrote, this, she wrote this uh, in, in, in praising Alice Milligan's work, that it should be remembered. As early as 1919, she wrote, The story of the men who loved Ireland has often been told, and I, with other Irish women, rejoice to do them honour. But I am a little jealous that of Irish women the hero tale has not been told, for they too love their country and work for it. And it is time that their candle was taken out of its bushel and set upon a candlestick to give light to the dwellers in this our house. Um, I, I think that it's, it, you know, it's, it's a real privilege in the context of this lecture series to be asked to speak about Alice Milligan. Um, and I think that, the, that, it, you know, that the, the, this image, this photograph taken by somebody in Oma of Alice Milligan in her 80s is a very powerful image because it shows that in the 1940s she was still culturally, politically very active and very engaged, which I think is a very inspiring um, image because we don't often see uh, women in their, in their older age in, in, in public space. Um, and certainly not in, in political life. Um, so I want to end with a quote by Alice Milligan, um, in which she writes in 1896, again in Belfast, she says, freedom is as yet to all appearances a far off thing, yet must we who desire it work for it as ardently and as joyously as if we had good hope that our own eyes should behold it. Um, and, and I feel that within that quote, uh, everything that Alice Milligan was working towards, the formation of a civic society in which people from very different political backgrounds, from different genders, could work together in the formation of a new civic state, um, is as much about imagination and hope as it is about an activism that was at the heart of her work. Thank you very much. Thank you.